Hi guys, Pharrell Williams here with Artist Talk. I'm sitting here with the coolest of the coolest. My new teacher, Henry Rollins. It's gonna be super cool. Check it out. You have to burn so much neural tissue on stage. You are pushing so many calories. So much of it is directed by the soul and the spirit of what you expect out of music. Those songs can make you feel ridiculously brave and somewhat impervious. <laughs> so, right, so don't, don't, you, don't you think that that is like your own version of Bitches Brew jazz? It was the one thing that felt the most natural. Just being on stage with no one else on stage, it's just me and a microphone relating to you, the audience. I fear failing them. I really fear failing them. I love them so much, they have no idea. Oops. We're in downtown Los Angeles with Henry Rollins. He became a household name as the front man for Black Flag and has continued to carry that punk rock attitude to much success in the world of music, books, acting, and activism. Thank you for coming to talk to me today. No problem, glad to be here. Huge fan, by the way. Thank you. What role did anger play during your formative years? Anger allowed me to find myself in that when I was a very young person, I spent a lot of time being very afraid. Afraid of classmates, afraid of people in the neighborhood, afraid of members of my family. A lot of time in mid-flinch, in, in cringe mode. And so that would be one long inhalation. And then I exhaled the roar. And that was me finding my anger. And my anger is with me to this day. I hope it never leaves me. And it doesn't manifest itself in ways like, uh, you know, hitting dogs or destroying property. It, it f fuels my curiosity. And if you think about it, anger's fueled a lot of very interesting things in the world. Fuels invention. Yeah, for sure. In innovation, you know, dissatisfaction. Unfortunately, there's a lot of downsides to it. You know, you, there's a lot of bad statistics. But for me, anger, it allowed me to go, no, no, yeah, I, I, can, I can be here. I was not an athlete or a good student, but the only thing that was really mine was my anger. And it really, it really helped me define myself as a young person. What music were you listening to as a teenager? I lived with my mother uh, most of the time. And my mother is a music lover. And so we would go to the record store one to three nights a week at one point, because we lived literally across the street from a great record store. I was raised with everything from Bartok, uh, Wagner, Chopin, Barbara Streisand, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, Woody and Arlo Guthrie, basically very, very eclectic. And if you're a young person, you hear whatever's around you, you like it because it's what's on. And so I would listen to a record my mother was playing and I would kind of take it away. And she would never come after it, she'd go buy another one. And so little by little my record collection grew. I was a very weird little dude as far as uh, what I listened to, because it was what I thought sounded good, but it was coming from a woman who had, would go see Coltrane and Miles, who had a very rarefied taste in music. Coltrane and Miles. Yeah, my mom used to, was quite the jazz person. And at one point I was going through her Miles Davis section and I pull out two copies of Birth of the Cool, which is just one of those records. Very important record to jazz music. I said, why do you have two? She said, you don't remember? We wore the first one out. I was like, wow. And so music was always a very important thing to me because I'm not big enough to be on the team. I'm not making friends very easily. So records don't hit back. Records don't make fun of you. And so I would go into my room and- Wait, 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 say that again. Uh, records don't hit you back. Records yes. don't tease you. That's right. The Beatles never say, you know, hey, you, you, you can't run fast or whatever. I liked records because they didn't judge you. You could put them on and take them off. And so I was one of those, like, like a lot of kids, I spent a lot of time alone in my room. And so the music put a very heavy dent in its power over me at a very young age. When you hear a record or some signal, some sound at such an early age, it not only becomes part of your life, it's like encoded in your DNA. Like the voice of Dionne Warwick. I've been listening to those records since I was this high, because my mom had them on. And years ago, I actually got a chance to meet her. And I said, I, I have to thank you. You know, you, you have no idea, but well, you're one of my surrogate moms. And she was really, she's like, wow. I said, yeah, since I was this high, you've been part of my, my structure. I'd like to be able to do the same thing to Gladys Knight, you know, if I ever got the chance to meet her, because those records, I mean, they're just perfect. But 
those songs, you know, th those, uh, I always, when I grew up, I, I said, when, when I grow up, I want to be a pip. I want to be like, you know, in her backing uh, vocal group and go, woo, woo, but you know, never got the chance. But um, so music, it plays a big part of my life. And I guess that's why your music sticks so well, because along with the aggressive adrenaline core of it all, so much of it is, is, is directed by the soul and the spirit of what you, you expect out of music. Like you have very high standards. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not much good with music. I made a lot of records, but you know, anyone can make a record. But um, uh, I've always- I, Why do you do that though? Why do you, all, like I see that, like you discredit yourself in a way. Like if, it, you know what, you're not discrediting because yourself. Because I know. But it's kind of, you kind of, you kind of taper it down. I try to keep it real. We would go up to this magical place, New York, and see these amazing shows, go to the great record stores where you'd ask for any punk rock record. Like, you'd say, do you have the thing, by the, but not the first pressing with the misspelling on the label, but the second pressing where the, the typo's been removed? <laughs> In your face for $1.50. And you'd stagger out with records that are now worth some stupid amount because people like me will overbid on them on eBay. And so New York was this... How did Black Flag get its start, and when did you realize that like, you guys were really on to something? Well, Black Flag had a very interesting history in that they were around before I was in them. Mm -hmm. They had- You were hired, no? Yes, they had three singers who all left and I knew the band in that I was living in DC. They would come through Washington on tour. They play the 930 Club. You're probably familiar with that place. We played there. Okay, and they would play there and different members of the punk rock scene would put them up because uh, no one could afford a hotel. And so myself, my friend Ian Mackay, we would put up visiting bands. So if you want to go meet Black Flag, just go to Ian's because they're sitting right there. And so we met them, became friends with them. And in 1981, they were doing an East Coast tour and they were not playing Washington, but only playing in New York. So I said, well, I'll go up, go see the band and, and drive back down. And so they, they, they did a show at Irving Plaza and it was amazing. And I, they said, hey, come with us. We're gonna play a bar down the street in like in an hour. And I said, okay. So I drove along with them like four blocks away, helped them load in the gear. And I'm looking at my watch going, I have to be at work in like seven hours. And I have a long drive back to Washington. And I said, hey, fellas, you know that song you do clocked in, which is about going to work and what a drag it is. I said, can you play that for me? Cause I gotta go to work. And the singer at that time, Des, said, uh, this is for Henry, cause he's gotta go to work. And then the, Des kind of looked at me and like, reached the mic out like you want to sing it I'm like well I don't mind if I do so is, I, is this I, on tape uh, I doubt it and so I jumped on stage and I sang it with the way I, I thought it should be right. he, you know just kind of like head exploding and I'll never forget looking around while we're doing the song at the rest of the band and they're all kind of looking at me like wow and I, looked, I remember looking at the audience you know, I was like that's uh that's something. And so the song was over very quickly and I gave the microphone back to, to Des. And I said, okay, well, I have to go. Uh, thanks, and I, I jumped in my car and went back down to Washington, kind of staying awake, thinking, wow, I was in Black Flag for 90 seconds. It sure felt good. And now back to work. And so later that day, one of the band members called me. They said, hey, you know, there's a vocalist slot that has opened up. You kind of auditioned the other night. You wanna come up here and really give it a go. And I'm looking at my minimum wage job, which it was a very good job, but I kind of grimly thought, well, that's gonna be my life. Just these jobs that make the feet swell at the end of the day. I just reconcile myself to a life of that. Or I can go to New York on an Amtrak train and audition for my favorite band. Well, let's see, what do I have to really lose? And so it was a very odd, kind of winning the lottery kind of story where I went from just some guy uh, working at an ice cream store, managing it, to uh, being, you know, and like six weeks later or so, I'm in front of like hundreds of some of the angriest young people I've ever encountered in my life, my first time on stage as the singer. With the entire front row, a bunch of, you know, surf crazies looking up at me, telling me I better be good or they're going to beat me up. So I, I, I passed muster and they didn't beat me up. They, they surely would have. And to this day, it's, it's one of the, I think one of those kind of rock and roll stories that sounds almost as cool as anybody else's. It's, uh, it's pretty bitching. When I was a child, you know, skating in a neighborhood called Salem Village, the guys that really, really, really shredded would be listening to Straight Black Flag. 
It's a good soundtrack. I mean, and I've seen a lot of dudes get, you know, their faces bashed in when your songs come on. Well, I was about to say, uh, those songs can make you feel ridiculously brave and somewhat impervious. So, <laughs> right, so don't, don't, you, don't you think that like, that, that is like your own version of Miles Davis, you know, that comprehensive, really serious, you know, bitches brew jazz. Well, it, you know what I mean? Like it's, I, I hear you. Just using a different medium, sure. no? As far as what, I've, what I take away from myself in all of that is, I gave it as much as I could, as many calories and ounces of sweat and blood as I could give to it. And I, I really went very fearlessly, like this could be the last show, let's just go, you know, ne never take our foot off the gas pedal. But my peers, my bandmates were like that too. And so to my credit, I will say that I gave as hard as I possibly could. How it sounds, what it means in retrospect, I don't know, but, but, it, it, but it, at the time. It matches. Okay, so, well thank you. But at the time, I took what I had and hurled it as hard as I could to what I thought was into the strike zone. Wow. We kind of wanted to be the anti-bad, and so we would be for the good, where we would drive by people and roll down the window and go, hey, hey, looking good, <laughs> and just keep driving. And you'd see the confusion, so I'm like, here we go. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> You've been quoted as saying that punk rockers are narrow-minded. What do you mean by that? Well, they, they sometimes can be. And back in my day, you know, in the 1850s when I was young, one summer Black Flag didn't cut our, we, we didn't cut our hair. Because we would get so much outrage from punk rock. Who are you, hippie? Like, yeah, I'm a hippie now. Because I haven't cut my hair for a week and a half. Like what, all of a sudden this is a, a, an elitist group? And I rebelled against that so much. Where we would play a song that was like four whole minutes long. Like, what's up with that? Like, what do you mean, what's up with that? We're trying something. And I found these people to be, certainly not all of them, but by and large, I found them to be some of the most elitist, closed-minded people I had ever encountered. I'm like, I'm back in high school with all these guys who are making fun of me. And I thought music is like the judgment-free zone. Right. And that if I don't like your band, I'm not showing up to the gig, but I'm not gonna stand around and put you down. Right. And you know, I got, life's too short. And so, I found punk rockers to be very restrictive. You'd go to some, some cities in some parts of America and there'd be someone who didn't look like all the others for whatever reason. And I'd watch from the stage as that person would get singled out and get pummeled and we'd stop the show because we can't have that. And, you know, flag is down on the play and I'm like, all right, you got to stop that. And then and all those guys now turn on you. And you're like, great. And, and you, you barely get through the show and you'll see them again. They're all waiting for you outside. So basically what you're saying is that what began as an escapism for you from where you were from and from your teenage years, a world where you could easily become bullied, you went into a world that was far more violent and far less tolerant than where you came from. So you went from the frying pan straight into the fire. Yeah, to a certain degree. I mean, certainly in all these places, there's great people. And by and large, they were really good. But there was this element, very close-minded and very authoritarian. And I went the other way. I'd like to thank them, because ultimately it got me into listening to Sun Ra and Albert Eiler. I rebelled <laughs> in my own way. Like, right. I found all kinds of other parts of the record store to go shopping in. And then, you know, years later, I had my own band, the Rollins Band. And we went very urgently in whatever we wanted to do, we did it. And it seemed to be in the zeitgeist. People seemed to like everything we did. We did very, very well. But uh, again, that could have been the times changing. Right. Because from the mid 80s into the 90s, I saw a lot of that restrictive kind of ideas with music start to break down. You know, in the 90s, bands that obviously you're very well aware of, bands like Nirvana and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains, like that big Seattle scene and yeah. the bands that kind of slayed the hair bands and all of a sudden everyone was scrambling to redefine FM music and, and uh, 
uh, the, the record industry and MTV. Yeah. A lot of those bands really helped break down barriers because you're not going to tell Kurt Cobain he can't jam out. You can't tell Soundgarden they can't put a big solo in the middle of their song. That's right. They're selling too many records. They're too damn good. They really were really great. Yeah. And so music changed. And so I think there's a lot of you know the generations that came before you. They you're in this dense forest of of culture. Bands before you, they, they hack through it a bit to allow a path. You turn the path into a single lane road. Then the next people pick up the baton, they turn into a two lane. And now it's like eight lanes, there's rest stops. And it's because everyone else kind of took it on the beak for the next generation to go out and do their thing. Wow. All of you, maybe, maybe most of you, if not all of you, have someone who's younger than you who looks up to you in some way. They listen to what you say. And that being the case, why would you get any young person around you and dampen their great and high-flying spirits? Wouldn't you do anything you could to put some kind of uh, inspirational gasoline on that inspirational fire that comes from them? That's one of the reasons I have a radio show. Kids write me, like, dude, I just bought my first Sun Ra record because of you. Mission accomplished. Now, the physical side of your life, like working out, tattoos, do you feel like that is another facet of your character? Well, tattoos, not so much in that all my tattoos are from the Reagan era. They're old like me, and now they're, they're turning purple and running, so I look like the guy in the Norman Rockwell painting, and that's fine. Uh, so when I was young, it was just basically decals on the chassis. At this point, at almost 52 years of age, I'm not really concerned on what the paint looks like as much as I'm concerned with what I think, how I think, and what I can get done. Right. Um, but as far as you know, going to the gym and all of that, uh, when I was young and in high school, I, you know, like I told you before, I, I, I couldn't throw the ball, too small for any sport really. And so the weights, you could lift weights though, you could go to the gym and just lift weights because they're just sitting there begging to be lifted. And so I had a high school teacher who's a Vietnam vet and I, I would carpool with him sometimes. And uh, he said, you know, you're- He you're seems very, to be a huge influence. Huge. And he said, you're really skinny. You know, he always was uh, not that friendly. Anyway, he said, I'm gonna teach you how to lift weights. You're gonna do everything I say. I went, okay. And so I did all the lifts that Mr. Pepperman instructed me to do. And it was the first substantive change I had made to myself. And when you change your sheer physicality, when your body shape changes, that sense of accomplishment is probably one of the most propellant forces in my life today. And the muscles, who cares about the muscles? It's the Applying yourself, the it's journey. the discipline. It, it, yeah, it's, it's a great journey. And to this day, that keeps the stress down to a minimum. So I'm not going to medicate with heroin or alcohol or marijuana. That's just not where I'm coming from. And so. And, that, and, and was that ever a, a, an option for you? I got drunk like three or four times in high school and, and just never liked it. I just, it really was depressing. Three or four times? I just never liked it. I, it was never, I, I did, I was like, I don't like this and, and now I'm going to vomit. And, and no one really around me did it could be my body chemistry. I mean, I don't even drink wine at dinner. I do no alcohol except in my Listerine. And I smoked marijuana once and really didn't like that. I just, it was really boring and I couldn't wait for it to be over. I'd much rather, you know, my high being on stage or just playing a record or, you know, life is fine. The rest of it could be just my biochemistry. It was all a depressant. All of it was a bummer. Mm. That's Which is probably perhaps lucky, because some people might find it obviously much to their liking. That's right. I, I looked at this kind of horrible alcohol product where you like lie on your side like you're in an opium den and just spike it open and just let it drain into you. Well, what, what vineyard was it from? There ain't no goddamn vineyard. You just drink the wine and you get screwed up and you go rob a liquor store and get some more and then you rape your daughter, you idiot. While you were with Black Flag, you also did spoken word. What? did spoken word do for you that you feel like you couldn't necessarily get out of the music? It allowed me to be on some tangent or do whatever I wanted and not have it be merely between songs where the rest of the band's like, uh, <laughs> what are you doing? Right. And so in 1983, there's a club uh, down the road from here and they would have a great, uh, uh, this like night, like once a week where they get like 15 people on stage a night. Everyone gets like 10 minutes. And so one night the promoter said, you got a big mouth. Why don't you get up there next week? I went, I don't know, man. And I, I said, why? He said, because we're offering 10 bucks. I went, 
I'll take that action. And so the next week I went up there and uh, said, well, here's what happened to us yesterday at band practice. And I told a story about what had happened at band practice when a white supremacist tried to run over our guitar player, actually with a car. Yeah, and, and Greg had to run up on a lawn as the guy tried to mow him down. Anyway, um, I told that story, and the audience were like, you know, they're like, what? And for us, it's just Tuesday. I mean, that's kind of a day in the life of Black Flag. And I said, yep, and um, well, my time is up. I got to go. And everyone's like, no, no, tell another one. And so afterwards, people said, you know, that was really cool. I said, what? They go, the story. I went, yeah, it was crazy. They go, no, you should do more shows like that, where you just tell stories. I mean, that was awesome. And it, of all the things I've ever done in my life, it was the one thing that felt the most natural. Just being on stage with no one else on stage, it's just me and a microphone relating to you, the audience. That felt like, uh, like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. The music is funner. It's like a thrill ride. But this, that felt like, there I am. Talk to me about the power of the audience's reaction when you're performing. My objective is to hold them, to keep, keep that line of communication open, uh, and to hold them to where when I finally say, thank you, good night, they're like, ugh. Wow, you know, what a ripoff. He's only on stage for half an hour, two hours. Like they, I, I want them to go like, I, it felt like 20 minutes. Yeah. And the way to do that, you have to burn so much neural tissue on stage. You are pushing so many calories you know, out of yourself to, to hold on to them. Yeah. Because it, it, you're trying to still a stormy sea. Yeah. And um, it's not easy to do. It's like trying to wrestle a marlin back to your boat with dental floss. You can do it, but you have to be really artful. And so the audience reaction to me, I don't care about applause or laughter. It's a connection you make where you, you literally feel like you, can, you are stopping time. And so there's moments on stage where you're just like, the whole world is just waiting you know, for the next thing to happen. And we're all waiting for it together. And there's these magic moments on stage where you're like, this is, this is bigger than all of us in this building. And I'm not saying I'm the proponent of that. I'm just saying we're all in this collective moment together. And, but to be aware of it and to some degree kind of being the ringmaster of it, um, it's a lot of pressure. And thankfully, I don't take myself seriously, but I take the audience real seriously. I really fear failing them. I love them so much. They have no idea how much more I need them than they'll ever need me. They are everything. They're the reason I, answer, I do all the books. They're the reason I, I just, they're it. They're, they're my it. And thankfully it's given my life a lot of, I know why I get up in the morning. Yeah. And uh, it's a great thing to get up to. There thanks, man. Thank this you. Was, this was super enlightening. Well, thanks for the forum. Thank you. Next time on Artist Talk, part two of my interview with Henry Rollins. We will get more political as we explore Henry's views on issues affecting our world. I'm not trying to cause unrest. I'm trying to start a conversation. It's so emotionally grounded where you come from. Minds have to change because the paperwork's already been laid out. The Constitution's the Constitution. That's it. You can amend it. So people are not following the rules. Don't treat your fellow Americans like it's box wine with a 30% discount. These are people. We have ideas and usually they look at us and they're, oh, you're a musician, so what do you know? Someone who would go across a desert that can kill you, I'm honored to share a country with you. That's heavy, man. Mm. It's as heavy as it could possibly get. Check it out. Pharrell Williams here. Hi, I'm Joy Bryant. I'm Eric Ripper. I'm Tom Colicchio. I'm Dr. Frank Lipman. The host of On the Table. The host of Across the Board. Host of Artist Talk. Host of Hooked Up. Host of the show, Be Well Week, Be Well Weekend, on the Reserve Channel. It's only on Reserve. Did you know that you can follow my show on social media sites like Facebook? Follow us on Twitter. If you're a fan of my show, hit the like button. All of the above. Share me with your friends. Treat yourself. You know, check out a new episode of my show, Hooked Up. And if you want to leave comments, feedback, ideas, whatever, love to hear from you. Leave a comment. And if you don't want to miss the show, be sure to subscribe. The one that's like down here, or is it here? Uh, somewhere down here. Thanks for watching the Reserve channel. Only on YouTube. Throw caution to the wind and ask yourself what rules.